Namaste everyone from Shobhito Ashram, Delhi branch. Today we have with us Professor Brij Kothari. Welcome. He is a professor at IIM Ahmedabad who started his journey from the Pondicherry School and went on to have his studies in MIT, Cornell and all those education institutes. And today is here with us to share his journey and we are looking forward and thank you for being here. And can you share with our audience your journey? Sure. Um, I started at age seven in uh, Pondicherry at the Shirobindo International Center of Education. Um, completed the entire course all the way from what they call flower room there, which is at a very young age, and then uh, all the way till knowledge, which is equivalent to BA or BSc. Um, I completed that, and then I went to IIT Kanpur to do a master's in physics. Um, and that was an interesting experience in and of itself, coming from a system that didn't have uh, exams to completely thrown into the crucible of the, the extreme form of examination, I would say. Um, so very, very strong contrast there. But then that was uh, a very positive experience also, and which I took then to the US when I did a master's there in communication at Cornell University. Um, and which again moved on to become a PhD in education. Um, and as part of my uh, doctoral research, uh, I went to Ecuador, actually, to the Andean communities there. So my field work for two years was uh, in the Andean communities uh, of Ecuador. And of course, something happened after that, a small experience, which of course we can talk about, but that experience finally to brought me to IIM Ahmedabad uh, on the faculty, and then I started doing that research, and which then occupied me for the uh, next twenty-five years, I would say. So, in a nutshell, that is my journey. Right. So, you spoke about that you went from an, a space of no exam to suddenly an exam. So, how would you like to see the contrast between the two? What was your experience like, or what are the different things that you found with no exam and now in the today's education system exam? So, what are your thoughts on that? I I think that it, I consider myself extremely fortunate to actually have gone all the way from age seven to age 20 or so without having to ever take an exam. I mean, that to me, I realized only later that nobody else had that experience around me at IIT Kanpur. Um, and, and they were fascinated with that as well. Uh, but I also learned something that Primarily because of my experience of not having an exam, it's also a skill that you have to develop, which I didn't have quite. So initially, it was a struggle uh, to actually come up with that skill. How do you take exams? Uh, but you pick up that skill pretty fast, I think. Um, and IIT Kanpur, one thing I really, really, uh, it, it just opened my eyes to how many smart people there are in the world. And you kind of live in a small place and you, you do interact with a lot of smart people and very accomplished people. And then you're thrown into another system where you see in one specific thing, let's say physics in my case, there, there was a guy who never came to class, but who always walked into exams and walked out first. And we're still struggling with the exam. And we thought this fellow knows nothing. Yeah. And actually he always solved the problems in his own way that the professor had not taught us. But he solved it correctly. Now we realize that, wow, this person, whoever taught him physics, has taught him in a very deep way. While we are trying to remember what the professor taught and exactly follow that path, this fellow had creativity been built into his uh, learning. That's why he never needed to come to the class. It is already so good. Uh, so so my opened my eyes to to the possibility that wow, people can be so so accomplished in 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 what they what they are passionate about. Uh, so that's the one thing which you found different. And how come you came from physics to all the way to education, and today now the education work you are doing? So what was your journey from physics to education? Yeah, um, serendipitous partly. Uh, it's not a planned approach, to be honest. Uh, it's it's like I was doing physics. And I missed that human touch a little bit in because I for I was in hours in the lab taking uh, measurements uh, 
uh, uh, night after night after night. And it, it's, it's some, somewhere the human touch was missing for me personally. Uh, so, so for me, because of my background in languages, especially in the, in the uh, ashram in Pondicherry, um, because also of a very all-round education, it was not that difficult to actually switch into any other field. Uh, it so happened that I picked communication. Uh, and at that time, I was interested in science communication. That's why I was trying to combine my background in languages as well as my background in physics. And that's how I applied to Cornell for that purpose. Um, and, and, and the beauty of the American system of education, I find, is that actually there was tremendous openness to pretty much go into any field and take courses in any department, uh, which I found wonderful. It almost, almost mirrored a little bit my, my early childhood experience. So that allowed me to go from communication to then discover that, okay, maybe education, communication are not that different in a sense. They're very allied fields. Um, and that's how I uh, got into education. Um, yeah. And what are your current engagements? Like, how has this journey brought you today? My, you know, journey a little bit at Cornell University was, was I would say, a, a place of discovery for me. Um, so, so even though I started in communication, my, my whole thinking was around development communication. How do you use communication as a tool for human development? And then when I moved into education, um, I got fascinated with the, the work of Paulo Freire, a Brazilian philosopher, educator, who actually talks about empowering uh, people in, at the grassroots to, to have their own sense of how they want to uh, study, what they want to learn. So in a sense, there is a continuity um, that, that you don't impose an education, but you allow uh, the sense of empowerment from education to come from the ground up. So I was fascinated with that. Um, so when I went to Ecuador and saw and spent some time in the, with some indigenous communities there, and these are farming communities, but they're indigenous people uh, in the Andes mountains. The one thing that they were concerned about is their knowledge. And there was not enough of a mechanism there in the communities to conserve that knowledge. They were complaining that, oh, our children are not learning. They, they were knowledgeable, but they were not able to pass it on. So we started to work on, on, on the idea of knowledge conservation. So, so then we started to see how they could become part of uh, the participants in the research. So I, it wasn't like I was going to go to the research and I was going to write a PhD. Right. Um, it was more like, how can they contribute to our research and how can we conserve that knowledge for them? I will of course get my PhD as well, but they needed to also get something out of it. And, and we finally ended up writing a book in Spanish and Quechua with their help, of course. Um, uh, and, and we visualized it pictorially so that the issue of literacy wouldn't come become a barrier for their children. Um, and, and now, the idea of literacy kind of was very much working on my mind. And then um, when I um, actually to learn Spanish, I used to watch a lot of Spanish films okay. and they all came with English subtitles. Okay. And at that time, the thought was, why don't they put Spanish subtitles on Spanish films? Maybe I'll catch the words better and learn the language better. Yeah. And then it was a very casual thought. Why don't they put Hindi subtitles on Hindi films? Or why don't they put Tamil subtitles on Tamil films? Maybe they'll do something for reading and literacy, not language learning, slightly yeah. different, but reading and literacy. And then I did a lot of research on it. And to my surprise, it was not a solution that had been uh, explored uh, much in research. Uh, it seems so obvious, yeah. but it wasn't, and it has never been implemented for reading and literacy, subtitling. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and we called it then same language subtitling. Uh, because we wanted to emphasize that subtitling is a general term right. uh, and mostly used for translation. Right. But what we were saying is, no, 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 translation has its value. Right. But same language subtitling, which is also captioning uh, for reading and literacy has a very different value. So, so that idea was in 1996. When I started joined I am Ahmedabad, I started doing research on it. Uh, so that's how that, that journey began, I would say. So 25 years ago, roughly. 
And how do you see this journey? Does it take you back to your roots from where you started? What is the contribution of that early education in the work that you're doing? Like, how do you see the whole idea and experience of education for you? In multiple ways, I would say. One is, of course, the fact that every child in the Sherbindo Ashram uh, learns about five, six languages almost through osmosis without thinking about it. Uh, and I, I found that as a given when I was growing up. But when I went to IIT, when I went to the US, people were just fascinated with that fact that how is that possible? How do your children don't get confused? Um, and because there's this whole thinking, even in academics, that no, 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 teach only one language, otherwise the child will get confused. It's a misplaced uh, intellectual pursuit, I think, because there's proof that every child, not yet, nobody's an exception. They, they, they used to think that, oh, I speak six languages, therefore I'm an exceptional person. And I was trying to tell them, no, 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 everybody does. In fact, all of India does two, three languages. It's, it's a very common occurrence if you're uh, growing up in a multilingual environment. So that, uh, lang the, the importance of language, of course, was, was always there. But then the reading literacy problem has to be solved at that level in India. You know, it's not easy to solve, uh, solve, actually. If you think about it, at an individual level, um, we think of teaching reading and writing as a, as a piece of cake, right? We, we, we've done it. We've done it to our children. And actually, the amount of effort that has gone into doing it and the regularity with which you've practiced and you've been exposed to books, that's actually a process through which we've gone through. But now we take it for granted. That, ah, it's a bad, uh, it's a very simple thing. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's, it's But it's, it's not the case when you start thinking of masses. So in India, I'll give you this uh, statistic. Um, 600 million people today, we consider them, them to be literate. Actually, they cannot read a class two level text. So somewhere we have we have we have missed that. But your question actually related to how does my ashram education um, helps me? The other way in which I think the ashram education helps me one is the technical part, but the other is other is as a I think I think one of the inspirations for me is always been we have to do something slightly bigger than ourselves, right? So that idea I think almost seeps into you without thinking. Um, so for me, it was uh, about taking on a problem that was big, that has not been solved for 75 years. Actually, we have not solved the problem yet. Okay. Uh, so for 75 years, uh, this reading literacy problem, uh, we have not solved. So take something big, something not just for family kind of thing, but at a na national level, I would even say, take a step further. I think I think the ambition, at least in this, is to think of it as a solution that is also useful for other countries. So, in a sense, you're talking about a global community where basically it's I think it's solvable that everybody on this planet can actually read. Right. So, it, at at that level, I think, uh, and 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 that inspiration obviously comes from Shravinder's life as well, um, uh, because you know he he talked about. Uh, human development. He didn't talk about individual national development. I mean, he did, but but he also talked about a much bigger idea. Uh, so probably some of that is just an inspiration that one draws, uh, maybe subconsciously. You know, it's not like, oh, it's a very, uh, okay, Shirovinda said this, therefore I'm doing this. I don't think that's how it is. It's more somewhere in the subconscious. It's in there. It's, I think it's in there in every person who probably grows up. In fact, now when we're having this conversation, it immediately takes you back to maybe you have it, but it's not, maybe you have not so much vocalized it that this is what I want to do. But it's just slowly and silently guiding you all along your path. Yeah, you I think I think so. I think so. I think the vision comes from somewhere else, right? Somewhere else. It's not, it's not something that is mechanical in terms of our education. It's coming from somewhere. Um, it's helping you process it later. Perhaps you'll, perhaps I'll process it even at a deeper level much later. Uh, but I know it's there. I know it's something is driving, which is uh, which is a little bit 
uh, one can't say this led to that, led to that. Yeah, but it's it's there. It's a force. I think it's a good way to put it. It's a force guiding. Yeah. So you think the kind of work which you're doing is your calling, or how do you look ahead? Like what your future holds for you? Do you want to take the same path, or you feel what will this come into? Like in terms of your current engagements, education, literacy, how will you take it forward? So we are at a stage where we've done the evidence part, and and you know I'm somebody who has been influenced a lot by the scientific process, and I hugely value that. Yeah, uh, and I would say that is one thing that perhaps um, I got more from my education, from IIT, from the US uh, universities, the, the, the rigor of science, that part, that part. And I think that was, that was perhaps one piece that, that I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to have, have, have experienced that and learned from that and, and understood its value. Now, that evidence base is what we use today to drive national policy and I know its value. It can't just be that somebody comes with a good idea and, and champions it and somehow it happens. To move mindsets in a bureaucracy in, at a policy level, et cetera, you need very, very strong, solid evidence built over a long period of time. And we've done that. Uh, now, based on that evidence, it is now same language subtitling the work that yes. we've been trying to promote on television and digital technologies for everybody's reading skills. Um, it's become national policy, actually. So it has now 50% of the content on television and digital technologies is required. It is slowly starting to be implemented. But there is time till 2025 to, to achieve that. But it's happening. Um, it took... You know, we've gone from rejection to resistance to apathy to final acceptance to now possibly celebration at some point, right? But we have gone through that process. Um, so that's one goal. Uh, once that is established at a system level, not at a at a and and when I I can go into why that needs to happen at a system level, which means that the private sector, the tele, the state channels, everybody will do it. Uh, we know that this will be India's contribution in some ways as a solution, yeah. because this challenge of reading skills in in languages that people speak. I mean, take this to Africa. Mm -hmm. The conditions are actually not that dissimilar. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of languages, a lot of reading challenges, and they are very passionate about content that they watch. So what we're saying is. This could be a solution that could also contribute. So in a sense, I'm seeing it more as India's contribution right. to um, a global uh, challenge. Uh, and somewhere it can contribute to also the sustainable development goals by 2030. So in a sense, there is a pathway for the next 10 years that I'm going to be engaged in. Um, but of course, that's not the end. You'll probably pick up something else after that. Like we have got a lot from you in terms of the journey, in terms of education and all of those things. How would you like to like conclude in a way what Indian education system as such need right now? And in reference to what your roots were and how you went to the West and you saw. So it's kind of a merger happening, a kind of integration happening of the two education systems. So in a nutshell how would you like to describe that and what are the hopes for our uh, future generations for that in bringing education together yeah uh, i think that somewhere we have crossed the line a little bit on the uh, competitive side perhaps we need to come back a little bit on the collaborative side so competition perhaps is is okay to some extent but competition with oneself is probably better than competition with everybody else, okay? So you're already trying to be a better person compared to what you felt you were, right? That's a different kind of competition. In a way. So I think that comes from the sports that we engaged in. We were always taught that it's not about coming first, second, third. It's about, can you improve yourself from your timing last time, right? So that, that has certainly, certainly helped. And I think that can come in a little bit in the education. But I think another thing that probably needs to happen in our education, we start valuing 
multiple talents start developing multiple intelligences and and these are already there if you go into a village and ask who is which child here is the best is a very good artist not the best artist sorry i i am slipping into it very good artist <clears throat> uh you will find uh, you may find that the person the child is may not be performing that well in school but that talent is not being nurtured somewhere so so in fact it's interesting that the talent shows you see on television today <clears throat> you it's amazing the kind of people who are coming forward on singing on dancing but these are not the only two uh, we also need for for other realms Uh, in fact there are farmers who probably have uh, knowledge of organic farming that we probably need to um, tap into as well so so recognizing identifying and bringing that into our education um so somewhere we need to shift that model um and and then and then maybe look for those people give them a platform let them come forward so i think that educate but then the, it's a whole systemic revamp that is required But at least there's a thought which we can put in and see how it works out. Thank you so much. It was very informative and very enlightening to speak to you. Thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you.